Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle, I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. So I've been covering the story of Jeanette, Janet Braun and Lauren the Mortician and their lawsuit against Becca Day, Caffeinated Kitty, and the host of the Do We Know Them podcast. And I've been covering this because it's hilarious and it keeps on being hilarious. And there's a new development, which is also hilarious. So let's talk about that. But first, a really brief recap for people who haven't been following this. If you haven't been following this, I really recommend you check out my really deep dives into the lawsuit. Uh, you can check those out. But very briefly, Lauren the Mortician was getting criticism online from people who were saying that she's a turf, And they brought various receipts for that. So this was causing Lauren the Mortician some stress, uh, maybe losing some followers, this sort of thing. And so she started issuing takedowns through her lawyer, Janet Braun, saying these videos criticizing me violate my copyright, even though the videos were almost certainly fair use. So uh, what happens on the internet when you start trying to silence criticism? Well, it doesn't work. People talk more about your stuff because now it's even more interesting because you're trying to silence it. And so this ends up leading to Lauren the Mortician and her lawyer, Jeanette, Janet Braun, sending a wellness check to Caffeinated Kitty. So they sent police officers to her door claiming that she was trying to blackmail them. Um, she wasn't. And various other things. So, yeah, and you might be saying, wait a minute, they sent the wellness check and they're suing Caffeinated Kitty? Yes. Um... So the criticism only intensifies after the wellness check because of course it does. Sending a wellness check is monstrous. And you know, if there's no basis for a wellness check, a false wellness check is horrible activity and it's basically peak party foul on the internet. So yes, of course people start criticizing this even more. So what's the solution? Well, a defamation lawsuit because apparently they've never heard of the Streisand effect. Yeah. Okay, so I covered that lawsuit and I don't think there's a whole lot of value to it, but it's just gotten a little more interesting. And that's because there's a minute entry that was just filed. So the lawsuit has been filed, but there's no statement of defense yet. But the judge is stepping in to say, um, I have some questions. I have some issues with this. And this is just on the docket. It's not a full sort of form. There's no sort of formally printed order or anything like that, but it is stuff they have to abide by. And this one is snarky. Now I'm going to try to have it scroll on the screen because it's going to be really hard to read if I try to pull it up, but it says minute entry before the Honorable Mary M. Rowland. In light of plaintiff's invocation of diversity jurisdiction as the basis for federal jurisdiction on or before January 31st, 2024, Plaintiff shall file a jurisdictional supplement as a separate docket entry. Why do they have to file a jurisdictional supplement? Well, because they screwed it up the first time. And I should have caught this. I am sorry, viewers, I should have caught this. I feel bad. Like in hindsight, when I look at it, I'm like, why did I not spot this? But the judge caught it. Let's explain. Jurisdiction is normally pretty boring because it's normally pretty obvious and pretty easy and it's not something lawyers usually get wrong. But uh, for federal jurisdiction, there's various ways you can get there and the way they're trying to get there is what's called diversity jurisdiction, which requires complete diversity between the parties as to their, as to their uh, citizenship. So what does this mean? Well, uh, the when they were sort of figuring out how the court system worked they figured hey what happens if people none of whom live in the same states have to sue each other because it's going to happen eventually right and so diversity jurisdiction requires that every person who's on the plaintiff side of the table be in a different state than every person who is on the defense side of the table the defendant side um, the plaintiffs can be in the same place, the defendants can be in the same place as each other, but you can't have any overlap between plaintiff and defendant. So that's necessary in order to get this jurisdiction issue. And the court calls out a little omission that I think is, in hindsight, really striking. And I, again, I should have caught it. I, I wish I'd caught it, but the judge caught it. So, um... As to Plaintiff Braun, 
plaintiffs are reminded that allegations of residence as opposed to citizenship are not sufficient to establish diversity jurisdiction. Now, the court is repeatedly going to say plaintiffs are reminded, which basically means, um, idiots, this is the stuff you were supposed to do. Do your freaking job. This is, this is what you had to do. And so what is the judge calling out here? Well, again, in order to establish the diversity of jurisdiction, they talk about where everyone is, where everyone lives. So plaintiff Jeanette Braun is licensed to practice Illinois and operating the law firm Braun Law uh, LLC in DuPage County, Illinois, and resides in Illinois on a part-time basis. Now, the court says reside isn't good enough. You have to be a citizen. What's the difference? Well, citizenship is where you are domiciled, which means the place you intend to live long term, the place you intend to have roots. It's different from where you're living right now. Because, for instance, let's say I got, um, let's say I wanted to take a course and it was a six month long course and it was in Ontario. I might go and get an apartment in Ontario and live there for six months, but my plan would be to come back here to Alberta where I live and stay and, you know, this is where my dogs are, this is where my house is, this is where my wife is, this is where all of the things are, right? So I might be living in Ontario, but still a citizen, you know, domiciled in Alberta. Here, they only say that she resides in Illinois and only that she resides in Illinois on a part-time basis, which means where's she residing the rest of the time? We're going to get to that because I've got a theory. Now, this isn't a pure omission because when we see like plaintiff Lauren Propson is a citizen and resident of the state of Wisconsin, Rebecca Day is a citizen and resident of the state of Missouri, although it's upon information and belief, and the court's going to comment on that. KC is a citizen and resident of the state of Georgia. Every person that they mention is a citizen and resident, except Jeanette Braun. Jeanette Braun, they only say where she resides. It's an interesting omission, right? And, hmm, why would they do that? Let's talk about that a little bit later, because... Ooh, it's fun. It's, it's fun. So, um, yeah, uh, the court says for individuals, citizenship means domicile, the person's long-term plan for a state of habitation rather than just current residence. And when the court is explaining all the law to you, that's not a good thing. As to plaintiff Braun Law, that's the, that's the company, the LLC, as opposed to Jeanette Braun herself. Plaintiff is reminded that the citizenship of LLCs is the citizenship of each of its members, which is probably just Jeanette Braun. So, um, thus, an LLC's jurisdictional statement must identify the citizenship of each of its members as to the date the complaint or notice of removal is filed, and if those members have members, i.e. if there's a, a corporation that is part of a corporation, uh, the citizenship of those members as well. So... You see the court is basically explaining to Braun and Lauren the Mortician's lawyer how they should how they should file their case. Um, the court shouldn't have to explain your job to you. That's a bad thing. So as to defendants Becca Day, uh, Casey, and Marston, plaintiffs are reminded that allegations of citizenship based on information and belief are insufficient to establish diversity jurisdiction in the Seventh Circuit. Plaintiffs are reminded that the law here doesn't work like that get it together. Um, so as to defendant Vasquez, and this one is interesting because defendant Vasquez, they filed something or they put in an interesting statement. It says upon information and belief, defendant Jessica Vasquez is a citizen and resident of a state that is neither Illinois nor Florida, but they don't tell the court where it is. Upon information and belief, defendant Vasquez is a victim of certain crimes and out of respect for uh, to her privacy, plaintiffs respect a request to not directly plead Ms. Vasquez's current state of residence. The court is going to give them a hard no to that one. Um, and they're going to explain how they should have done it. Like, hey, no, you can't do that. But here's how you, you do the thing. So as to defendant Vasquez, plaintiffs are reminded that allegations of negative citizenship or citizenship of 
another state different from the plaintiffs are insufficient. And so uh, plaintiffs allege that defendant Vasquez is a victim of certain crimes and out of respect to her privacy, plaintiffs request to not directly plead Ms. Vasquez's current state of residence. As mentioned, allegations of residence as opposed to citizenship are not sufficient to establish diversity jurisdiction. Plaintiffs should file a motion for leave to file under seal any portions of the jurisdictional supplement pursuant to local rule 26.2 sub c, i.e. If you don't want to put where she lives into the public record, cool. Um, that's, we understand where you're coming from. Here's how you do that. You file it under seal. You don't say, well, we're not going to tell the court. Um, court's not got any patience for that. They're like, the requirements are you tell us where she lives and that's it. So... Plaintiffs may seek leave to file a motion to conduct limited jurisdictional discovery. So basically to find out where people are living and where they plan to continue living. Joint initial status report remains due on or before February 28th, 2024. Okay. Now I said that this one was fun and it is, even though we're talking about jurisdiction, which is one of the most boring legal issues normally on the planet. So you remember how I talked about the need for complete diversity of jurisdiction. So no plaintiff lives in the same place as any other defendant. Well, um, where does Jeanette Braun have her domicile? Where is she a citizen of? And I don't know for certain. I have a theory though, because Jeanette Braun had some legal difficulties in a little known state called California. And she also has a divorce going on in that same little known state, California. So I'm not criticizing her for having a divorce. I don't know the details on that one. I don't care on the details on that one. That one is none of my business unless it starts becoming relevant to this somehow. The only way it's relevant right now is that normally you'd have a divorce in the state where you're domiciled, the state where you're a citizen of, which suggests that Plaintiff Jeanette Braun might be a citizen of California. And California is, there's something that is worth noting about California. When you think about where you want to file a defamation suit to shut someone up, um, there's different states that are sort of, you know, green versus, you know, yellow versus red, if we're thinking of our stoplight rules. And then there's California, which is just marked on your map as here be dragons. California is the worst place to do this because California has very, very strong anti-slap statutes. So Jeanette Braun really doesn't want this to end up in California, but what's the problem here? Well, she's saying that it should happen in Illinois because she lives in Illinois. But does anyone live in California? Well, um, we don't care about Lauren Propson because again, she's on the plaintiff side. Uh, Becca Day, Missouri. Okay, no problem. Casey, Georgia. No problem. Uh, Jessica Vasquez, um, she doesn't say. Um, I think I know where Jessica Vasquez lives. I'm not putting it in here, um, but not California is my understanding. Lily Marston, citizen and resident of the fine state of California. So what does this mean? Well, this means that possibly this whole lawsuit has got to get kicked out and sent to California. Here be dragons. And I think the argument is going to be that it's going to be bound by the laws of the state of California, including that lovely anti-slap law. Now, California's anti-slap law is much broader than the anti-slap laws in a lot of other places because it includes a provision that covers any written, it protects specifically, any written or oral statement or writing made in a place open to the public, such as say, TikTok or YouTube, um, or a public forum in connection with an issue of public interest. Well, what's an issue of public interest? Amongst other things, statements about celebrities or people voluntarily associating with a celebrity, like say, Jeanette Braun and the way she's associating with Lauren the Mortician, who is certainly claiming to be a celebrity. In fact, that is a basis for the defamation suit. Um, 
Jeanette Braun is arguably a celebrity in her own right. She's got a monetized TikTok. She's out there trying to push her name. She might be a tiny wee little celebrity, but that's still probably enough to bring it into the whole public interest thing. Okay, so that's our first problem, is that this whole thing might get kicked to California. Um, and I say might because I don't know. We, I'm going to be really looking forward to seeing what their jurisdictional supplement is. But let's do some further analysis on the assumption that Jeanette Braun is a citizen of California. Well, now we have an issue because I mentioned before, or I've mentioned before that it's a, it's really unusual that the lawyer and the client would join together to be co-plaintiffs on a lawsuit because some of that decision may in and of itself be counted as legal advice. Like if these two discussed that it was a good legal decision to bring this lawsuit, then maybe there's some legal advice there and maybe Jeanette Braun owes a duty to Lauren the mortician about how this gets brought. And the problem is, is that Jeanette Braun in this lawsuit, if she lives in California, is a giant legal anchor that might drag this thing down to the bottom of the ocean and then have it hit a landmine because California's anti-slap also provides for attorney's fees and costs. It can be very expensive to be anti-slapped in California. Very very expensive. So, um, if there were independent legal advice, that independent legal advice might have told Lauren the mortician, do not sue with a California resident. Sue separately. You have separate claims. Like, why would you sue together? This makes no sense. Which means that there might be a claim by Lauren the mortician against Jeanette Braun here. And this poses a problem for Jeanette Braun. It also poses a problem for their current counsel, Benjamin Lockyer, because he represents both. And if a conflict arises between the two clients that he represents, he has no option but to get off record. So um, this is becoming a, an ethical, legal Quagmire. And previously I'd looked at this lawsuit and said, if this was a lawsuit I had filed, I would be chewing my own leg off to get out of the trap I have set for myself. And I'm going to say, I would be chewing every leg off to get out from this trap at this point. If indeed Jeanette Braun is a citizen of California. And, um, yeah, this, this is a minor little thing. Like the court just is like, Hey, um, fix your lawsuit. It could end up being a giant, quiet little bomb. And I am so, <laughs> so astounded that this is becoming a thing, right? Um, lawyers, if you ever find yourself inclined to join a lawsuit with your own client, um, it had better be something like, we were together in a car that got hit or something like that. I, I don't understand how this is happening. This whole thing just hurts my brain. Um, yeah, fun times. So let me know in the comments what you think. Um, as I mentioned, I don't know for certain, but this looks bad. It looks bad. And uh, we'll find out. We're going to find out where Jeanette Braun is actually a citizen of because leaving it out of the lawsuit like that seems real, real interesting. Anyway, let me know in the comments what you're thinking because how could this case get any funnier? Well, it got funnier. It just did. So... Anyway, I want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, uh, CCFR, Canada's National Firearms Association, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association, as well as Lembas for the Elf. And at the $20 level, Lindsay Metcalf, Larry Kalniak, Kyle Fox, Drunkle of the Baileys, Cameron Johnson, Andrew Elsich, and Vicky, as well as Dorky Dane. Thank you as well to my $10 supporters, who will be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you for watching. Hope this has armed you with knowledge. See you next time.